planning an event and wondering how you can give your attendees the best experience possible? Take advantage of customized meetings with Hilton that make it easier than ever to incorporate health, wellness, entertainment, and waste reduction. From yoga and yogurt morning starts to puppies and ice cream afternoon breaks, Hilton will help you build an extraordinary meeting that attendees will remember. To book your next meeting or event, go to meetings.hilton.com. That's meetings.hilton.com. Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here are your hosts, BizBash CEO David Adler and Editor-in-Chief Beth Kormanick. Hi, David. Hey, Beth. Here we are, another Gather Geeks. And today our guest is Brian Raffinelli of Raffinelli Events, someone that should be familiar to longtime readers of BizBash. We've uh, written about his innovative designs for events. He's a top event designer and um, has just contributed to our, our coverage throughout the years. And in addition to his work for corporate functions and nonprofit events, Raffinelli has designed more than a dozen events for the White House during the Obama administration, including state dinners and the holiday decorations in 2015 and 2016. He also designs weddings with clients, including Chelsea Clinton and Matt Damon. I've attended several of his events here in New York. And David, you've known Brian for years. So what is his secret to his longevity? Well, I think he is a he has combined the idea of being an incredibly creative shop with business know-how, business acumen, so that he makes sure that he's operating in a very rational manner, uh, and he basically cr- turns creativity into a good business. So in the conversation here, he's going to share his insights on must-have moments at events, how he challenges his team and his thoughts on developing his business. And, you know, while he's built this hugely successful business, it may surprise our listeners to know that it wasn't easy. He's had failures along the way, which he readily admits and has learned from. It's really interesting stuff. So let's take a listen. So thank you, Brian, for being here today. We're uh, focusing uh, this sort of art project on first impressions. And before we get going, where do you stand on the first impression from an event perspective? Look, I think uh, that it's all about first impressions. I'm not a a believer that there's only one impression, though. Um, I think there's like 10, 20 first impressions at any great celebration. And how does that, how do you you narrate, narrate that? How do you plan that because nothing happens by accident when we were with Brian Raffanelli. <laughs> <laughs> That's a quote. You got that right. Uh, well, as, as a, a basic standard, like a really as a baseline, you know, we have to have three to five like wow moments at our events. It's just, I, I, I like put it in the DNA of my creative team. Right. And when, when they're presenting to me before, you know, during the creative process, I'm like, okay, what are they? What are they? Um, and if they can't verbalize them to me, then they don't exist. Right. So think about that. Can you continually keep somebody's mind moving through a, you know, 120 minute experience, you know, and I want to do that. So that means we keep half having to make the guests feel like something's happening over and over and over, but it's not the same thing. So we do it by just thinking about it methodically and that something happens every 20 minutes. I mean, there's the secret sauce to a Raffinelli. <laughs> That's a Raffinelli rule? <laughs> oh, yeah. Every 20 minutes. It doesn't minutes. matter what it is. What about the first one? Well, the first one often has to be the biggest one, but I'm a real stickler for saying, you know, this just can't be some fabulous thing made out of 2,000 light bulbs that, you know, dances across the sky. It has to have some kind of connection back to my client, right? To their brand, to the company, to the product we're putting forward, to their story, because that's that thing that will happen because people have an expectation, right? They're going to walk in and say, oh, I'm coming to this event. This is what's going to happen. It could be the place. It could be the client. It could be the product. So you're expecting something. So what can we do that's going to say, oh my God. And so what are your top 10 all-time best? (laughs) Top 10? (laughs) Well, you can go with three. (laughs) Go with three. Three things. Well, look, we just produced um, Breast Cancer Research Foundation at the Armory. And I was thinking about this when I think about the subject, right? First impression of going to the Armory is, damn it, that place is giant. So if you've never been, it's like five football fields. So that's the guest's impression. So we had to have them walk in there and feel that it was more intimate. And by the way, 
we're raising money to cure breast cancer. So it's a community of really strong women and corporations that are going to get the job done. So we want to make it feel that way. So we literally drop the ceiling in this giant space with 2000 latex white spheres that floated above you. And that really made it intimate. There was a community that was created. So that was boom, that was the first impression. But then when you went on right into the dining room, 1400 people, how can that be intimate? We put this giant screen in there that's 300 feet wide. Think about that. 300 feet wide. Wow, wow that's, <laughs> that's a big. big <laughs> you want a big impression? <laughs> yeah, that's a big impression. <laughs> and then inside that, right, is all this amazing animation and movement. And that's a million impressions, right? Because all of a sudden this thing comes alive in front of you. And while you're sitting there eating your, you know, beautiful chicken dinner, you know, that's organic. Um, and you look up, it's changing dramatically all the time. That's what I love about technology. Um, so it's not just the cool thing that we can build or the flowers or the lighting. It's, it's the science behind technology inside a screen. How about the pacing of that? How, at what point do people get overblown with the impressions? I mean, how do you, how do you pace it? Well, look, there's, there, if you think about it, it's almost like wallpaper, right? So you come in a room, you have this stunning, gorgeous pattern, and then does it go away? You know, maybe, but in animation inside a giant screen, it, it becomes part of the narrative. It's part of the dialogue. You get used to it, but then all of a sudden it comes up and it comes down and that's the energy of the party, right? So in between courses, it pops up. Every time somebody really important comes up to the stage, it pops up. And of course they're going to say something brilliant, but we want to complement that and make it more theater-like because in fact it is. And the sound, uh, how do you view sound and music and things like well, that? Well, you know, what's interesting about sound, David, is this, um, and this is a guy who's, you know, on the other side of 50, um, admittedly, that we want, we're always really careful about that, that it's not an IMAX theater. We, want, we don't want to blow them away with sound, right? But because we want them to feel comfortable all the time, unless there's some big giant thing that's about to happen. But I think comfort is another piece of the puzzle um, that people will walk away and remember that and say, I went to this event and it wasn't loud. <laughs> what, all right. What, what about the what about music as a, an energy level uh, well look, engager and things uh, like that? Uh, you, I'm a giant fan of music. of thinking about the beat of the music, the right? So when you come into a party, oh, I want to hear know, Brian's rules. No, on the, I really because I think like, that's a science there be a in damn, itself. Like right? three piece in the corner. Yeah. Well, of what, course not, because yeah. nobody can hear that. All the right. bodies are absorbing it. But there should be recorded digital music <laughs> that is at the right level that everyone can feel the music. They can have a conversation, but they can hear Aretha Franklin or whomever in the background and they get into that beat. And it should be fairly familiar, by the way, because people like things that are familiar. But if there's a little toe tapping happening in a cocktail party, we've that's, scored. That's scored. Okay. <laughs> so what it, take, the, take us through that, that one event. What was the, um, the next 20 minutes after the screen? Well, so the next 20 minutes really was very thoughtfully choreographed lighting cues, animation built into those screens, and then all of the live action that was about to happen. Elizabeth Hurley comes out, Leonard Lauder comes out, you know, that the headliner comes out. So all of those pieces, every everything that I think you're getting to a little bit here of like the five senses are cooked into that. It's like baked into it perfectly. So we know what's going to happen every second while the guests are there. And by the way, they don't know that. You know, I think that's what's so critical. Right. right. They're just, something's different. Something is different. And if we go back to first impressions, you have this impression that this football field space is not going to be intimate. I'm going to hate being at this event with 1,400 people. But in fact, when Mary J. Blige comes out and everybody rushes the stage and it feels all of a sudden suddenly big and cool, that's great. Because the two hours prior to that, you were sitting at your table, you know, cocooning with your, your guests and, and in this sort of magical space. And you're planning every second of this. Every second. If every I learned second. anything, this is, you know, yeah. by working at the White House, yeah. <laughs> was the TikTok? every <laughs> second is planned, right? Yeah. And repeated and repeated and repeated. And, you know, and that, I do this with my team all the time. Like, walk it through again, walk it through again. Whether it's something as, you know, small as a wedding to some giant, you know, corporate thing. I do the same thing, go over it and over it so we can watch for what could happen. Did that experience, uh, tell us a little bit about what you did at the White House. I know we worked together a little bit in the State Department, but what was your role? Because they kind of kept you, they kept it sort of quiet <laughs> that you were doing <laughs> such an incredible, incredible job. Well, look, the, uh, for one second, uh, 
you know, it's, it's in fact true that, uh, you know, I, I got a fair amount of accolades from the first lady and the president, you know, whenever I would see them, but I was part of a team. Yeah. And it's one thing that I learned about the white house. You know, you have people in there have been there with four or five administrations. They've done extraordinary things. The butlers, the ushers, the floral, you know, department. I mean, they've been there for a long time. This is their career. This is their job. And we complimented that. That's what we did. So we were brought in by the first lady, by the social secretary to design these experiences. They were produced and planned to the second by all the brilliant people inside the house. And we were happy to be a part of that. But we also wanted to make it, we wanted to supersize it. You, know, well, you, ch- you changed a lot of the rules. Well. <laughs> I mean, there was like things there were, that you had never seen in the White House before, and all of a sudden they're there. Well, all I did was present some interesting ideas <laughs> yes, you to did. the First Lady, and she liked them. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that was the best part. You know, you know hanging 3,000 snowflakes down the East Colonnade. You know, who knew? That, that was cool, right? Or, you know, my favorite thing was building the bow and Sonny, the dogs, for Christmas. You know, we built one that was six feet tall, one that was eight feet tall out of 30,000 little black pieces of white, black and white pieces of yarn. I mean, it was so cool because the kids stood next to it. Actually, everybody stood next to it, Secret Service, everybody, (laughs) and had their picture taken. So that that was dynamic to make that house come alive. How did it make you feel? I mean, it had to be the most incredible experience. Uh, You know, I mean, every time I crossed that threshold, every single time, and never, ever, ever, ever got old. Like I knew how lucky I was, how lucky my team was, the talent we brought in the house. Um, And I would say that to my team. I'm like, don't do this unless this means something to you, unless you want to pee your pants, because this is history. And we're this narrow, narrow, narrow group of people that actually get to come into the White House and decorate it, change it. Well, you were not only doing that. I, there's a great um, guy, uh, a- Alex Pentland, who wrote a book called Social Physics, How mm-hmm. Ideas Flow. And a lot of the things that you did were actually scientifically planned to get people to talk to each other. Well, of course. In, in important ways and yeah. getting those people together mm-hmm. changed the world. You're right. You're so, right. So they're, they're, you know, I do this in, every day. It's not, yeah. It wasn't just for the holidays yeah. at the White House, but, but honestly, the 56 trees and the 25 rooms and the private residence, like I wanted, is, and, and this really was a directive, of course, from the First Lady of like everything had to have a story. Yeah. And I know intuitively that that's what makes a great celebration. When you walk away and say, wow, like right. you understand them. Right. So that, you know, in corporate world, that's like, a, that's the brand and you get the brand right. personality. Um, but in, you know, in, in going to the White House at Christmas, do you expect to walk away and go, wow, you know, I was so moved by that tree with all those messages from families that are, you know, out there right now and their sons and daughters are serving our country. There was a power yeah. behind it. Yeah. And that was, that, that's the real deal. What's your, what, what were the, what were your favorite state dinners uh, and why? Mm, uh, my number one is uh, Germany, State Dinner for Germany, because it was open air in the Rose Garden. And nobody, everybody said we couldn't do it. You know, it was just, it was Is this the one that was to supposed do. to almost rain? <laughs> well, <laughs> sort of almost <laughs> rain. Um, so, you know, I, I, the, the famous story is that I'm on the phone, a phone call with the new, brand new social secretary, Jeremy Bernard, and 25 people. And we're talking about a 20% chance of rain at 530 coming from Northern Virginia that was going to come over DC. Like, really? And <laughs> so nobody was willing to pull the plug. And I was like, okay, guys, 80% chance it's going to be perfect. We're going to go for it. Let's go for it. We hung up. It was a perfect night. (laughs) (laughs) Thank God. Thank God. The president did say to Jeremy Bernard, so what were we going to do if it rained? (laughs) It was magical. Imagine being in the Rose Garden of the White House, of like throwing pattern light up onto the White House, of candlelight, and, you know, Andrea Merkel out there with James Taylor and the Washington Symphony Orchestra. I mean, it was magic. When's the big event? Hilton is here for planners with their exclusive customized meetings. Become a wow maker and save time by letting Hilton help you present an extraordinary event, one that leads to memorable and meaningful connections. Visit meetings.hilton.com and let Hilton help you. So when you watch these people who have seen everything, they're also 
their first impression has got to be like uh, incredible as well. Well, goosebumps. So we did the state dinner for Korea, and I was coming around the stairs to go downstairs, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg was walking down the stairs, and I I offered to help her, and she said thank you, and I'm walking down, and she's like, you know, I've been in this house many many times, I've never seen it look like this tonight. Boom. Wow, that was that was that was, uh, that it's was like, okay. Nice I think comment. we got it. Well, that's I think great. we got it right tonight. That's great. <laughs> and how does this translate? I mean, uh, you're the king of Boston. Uh, every time I meet somebody in Boston, they know you. Ravinelli, you, Ravinelli, Ravinelli. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and you've got this reputation that you raised the bar there in an incredible mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. What are you doing in Boston that uh, enabled that town to sort of appreciate what you do? Mm, you know what? I, I, that sort of attention to detail and storytelling is really, you know, Boston definitely has a reputation of wanting quality and great service um, and loves a big wow. You know, everybody has this impression that my clients in Boston don't spend as much as my clients in New York. That's not true at all. You know, and everyone's like, what? Um, but it's true. You know, they, they really love quality. They love a great story. They're very philanthropic and it's a relationship city in its core. So and when is you it, build events around relationships, right? It's a, it, it, are there a lot of the same people going to the same events? Oh, or is, no, it's not pretty, necessarily. Pretty diverse. It's right. really diverse. No, no, yeah. incredibly diverse. So that's the other part of the magic. I mean, because yeah. certainly built into New York City, right, is a billion events, yeah, right? So exactly. not a whole lot of crossover. <laughs> not a whole lot. I mean, <laughs> you know, and that's yeah, great in my yeah. business. Yeah. Um, but it's not like I'm pushing out a Mardi Gras party every right. night of the week. But right. at the same time, um, no, Boston is very, very interesting when you break it apart. Have you changed? I've asked some other people this. I was in Toronto recently. Um, there's a hospital called Sick Kids, mm-hmm. and they completely changed their approach from a fundraising perspective, from uh, dealing with sympathy for children to activism. Mm-hmm. And we're wondering if that is going on in other parts of the world because of the political situation. That people are, is it, are you seeing a subtle shift or is it, is it the same? Well, look, I think, I think the perfect recipe in, is. A little bit of both. Um, so sure, there's a power of activism right now. But look, when I started in 1980 something with the AIDS crisis, there was a lot of activism yep, yep, behind yep, that. A lot. And then breast cancer rolled out, right? A lot of activism. Mm-hmm. So there's cycles to this, right? But they're I taking mean, they're taking sort of benign things like a disease mm-hmm. that was, used to be done on sympathy, right? And they are doing it on yeah. that's you know yeah. Create a movement. Let's let's. Which let's, I think is is interesting. Well, it's, it's a sign of our time. It's a sign right? of our time. And yeah. so, you know, it's a it's smart to take advantage of that power. Right. 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 You I, you spent a little bit of time working on political events. <laughs> Just a little. What have you learned from selling ideas to people at political and candidates and sort of like what do you do at an event that drives emotion, changes people's minds? You've plan every little thing, how do you mm-hmm. plan that? Specifically for a political event, look, I, I think with political events, when, you know, I say this with love, the expectation is so low <laughs> that a, a little bit of organization yeah. and theater yeah. goes a really, really long way. Yeah. And that's that's what's been missing, I think, in political. What does events. that look like? Well, a, a, it's, a version, you know, a good version of that. You know, it, it could be. You know, it's not just a giant American flag. You know, behind the candidate anymore. It's really thinking through what people are going to see and how they're going to feel. I, look, I think President Obama did it best. You know, like every cutaway shot, there was hope everywhere. You know, yeah. so there's that kind of thing on a presidential race is what's expected. But when you come now down to very specific small races, there's power behind that. So it's just not, by the way, on the shoulders of this poor, you know, politician, he or she sitting there saying, I better give the speech of my life in this, you know, assisted living facility tonight or I'm not going to do well. No, 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 no. It's a combination of the the, the what they say, the power behind it, but also the organization behind it. It's critical. Right, right. You know, our success in nonprofit is that you walk away and say, these guys know what time it is. I've invest, they're investing my money wisely. They respect my time. They gave me a message I can, you know, digest in six minutes or less. Like, that's what politicians have to do. More and more and more. more. And that's the thing we're putting forward. And those experiences of like, look, you've got this one shot and you have to do it in six minutes or less. (laughs) Because I'm going to get distracted. (laughs) Because our attention spans nothing. Well, no, right. But why shouldn't it be as interesting and clever and, you know, uh, you know. And how do you do that? 
Brian Raffanelli just to figure out everything? <laughs> well, you just, you, you, look, no, no, no. You, you, you take the formula of the giant and then you bring it back down. Okay. Look, my favorite thing to do is like, chart, you know, test my team and say, okay, we're going to go into a Dwayne Reed today and I want you to design a party and come out and I want it to be better than the million dollar parties we do. And what, what, is, what, is, what does it look like? <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of scrunchies, <laughs> <laughs> napkin rings. <laughs> um, well, it often looks really cool because you're, ta- you're making something out of nothing, yeah. you know? And I look, I love the million dollar parties. Yeah, yeah, Don't yeah, get yeah, me wrong yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> if you're listening. But I also love this idea that it's not about money. Yeah. It's about taking something you know, an idea, story, a narrative, and then taking all these simple things and whipping it into shape and having it become something incredible. Um, that's what I really like. And that can be done every single day. And how do you, how does that Maya Angelou feeling come through? How do you get that? How do you get that? I mean, it seems like the Holy Grail is still, how, how does it make you feel? Oh, right? yeah. So yeah. how do you translate the incredible set the feeling. Look, it's being very, very thoughtful and overthinking it. Overthinking it. Yeah, you've got to do it. You've got to, you know, my creative team is always like, I want them to imagine the outrageous. I don't want them to think about timing, moving, costs. Like, don't think about that. My production team, I want them to be smart, but also think about how far can we push this? How can we do that? You know, to make that kind of blue sky, that amazing, you know, dream thing happen. It's critical to start there. Because if you start in the middle, what do you get? Right, right. Mediocre. Right, right. You don't want that. But it sounds like you're really the coach of, the, of this creative team as opposed to someone that's sitting there creating the idea of yourself all the time. Yeah, that's true. Right? So that's you're very like true. Well, I had to replicate my creative yeah. team or I would never grow. Yeah, that's right. 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 Um, and by the way, I wouldn't, you know, I, I need to be tested. Right. I need to be challenged, you know, as a creative person myself. Right. So I really am, am really, really deeply invested in understanding how you can take a creative team and supersize them, right? And make people think creatively all the time. But you're, but you're a, I've noticed uh, in knowing you, that not only you're sort of left brain and right brain, mm. you've got process creativity as well as you know, true. decor and design right. creativity. I give that all to my father, who was a lawyer, and told me I could never be an artist. <laughs> or I could be an artist, but I would have to do it on the weekend. But you're balancing that out well, in this right. business. So I was determined you, to say, okay, I, I'm going to prove I can do this. I'm going to, you know, go to school. I'm going to get all the intellectual property I need, but I, but I was not going to give that up for the creative side. Right. And then when I went into business, you know, we, I used to call them artistic successes, right? We do events that made no money or, or, or was at a loss. I mean, my first business was a totally failed business, but it was because I was too creative and not smart enough with the pocketbook, right? So I knew I had to, to not only survive, but to be successful, I had to figure this out. So could I put as much time into my creative thought as I do into my business and, and the, the production side? Right. This is the lesson for everyone who's aspiring to be Brian Raffinelli and needs to listen to it, <laughs> Don't right? do it. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. But the thing is, what, what is your sort of bottom line? I mean, if you failed once doing this, there must be at some point that you watch things and say, it can't go further. I mean, it's like watching the cash come in in your company. Right. I mean, I mean but know. I also, I mean, I had faith that we could figure it out. Yeah. What, did you, what, did, what was the answer? The answer was this perfect recipe of saying, okay, you can be as creative as you want, but you have to figure out how to make this profitable. But how do you do that? Well, like I know that's your secret sauce. Kind right. of. <laughs> well, it but, is, I but, mean, but it's still, it's sort of like the thinking. Well, you is, think about time because all we have is time. Is time the management that yes, you need to time. worry about more than anything? Because as a creative person, you will spend hours, hours. creating a flower. And, if, and, and the best thing, the best exercise to do is to just keep a journal for 30 days, how many hours it takes you to do something and what you're getting paid to do it. When I'm in front of, you know, conferences, with people that do what I do, I'm like, guys, think about it, you know? You could be making $6 an hour. If that's what you want, right. knock yourselves out. But that's not really what I think everybody wants. So do you believe that, I mean, you're, you're making sure that people are um, making money properly yeah. based on their labor? Well, look, I think that we all deserve, we have, yeah. all have value. Yeah. So to find the value. Right. You know, right. And that, if you and spend that's 40 all hours doing something that's not worth it, you're wasting yeah. your money. Yeah. yeah. Unless it's your total life passion. Yeah. That's yeah, the interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. thing about an artist, right? Because yeah. they could take, you know, how many months to work on one piece, right? right? And others are, you know, right. shooting them out. Right. But that's, that's an interesting conundrum when you're just purely an artist. Right. 
So let me just end on this one area in terms of you talk about how do you replicate yourself and grow. Where is your company going? You're, you're definitely <laughs> uh, not somebody I'm that's still trying ready to take to over retire the world. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you've got some ideas, I'm sure. Like, where do you see a business like yours going? Well, you know, in, as, as we're standing here right now, what's happening is all the good things are happening, right? So people are coming and saying, we want you to look at our 80 events that we do globally and tell us how they can be better, how our brand can live inside it. You know, I can see the future from here. That's a nice gig, right? Right, right? So that's where, and if I can replicate this creative process, right, then I can drop that in. And I can be like, yeah, we can be in all these places but not produce all of these events. Um, but we can definitely, you know, help you um, be the best, you know, event producers that you can be. That, to me, that's the future, you know. And, and, and look, I'm a creative thinker in every aspect. So with nonprofits, with corporations, right. my private clients, you know, that's the name of the game. And so right. that's who we are. Um, and I feel good about that. Okay, so how can people get in touch with you? Oh, my God. Like, like this is a practical <laughs> question. Well, since I live on Instagram, <laughs> message, message me on Instagram. What's your Instagram? Uh, Raffinelli Events. And then I have a personal one, Brian Raffinelli. If you really want to get inside my head, go to my personal one. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Raffinelli Events is a portfolio of our work. Okay. But that's the best way. Great. You know? Great. Well, thank you, Brian. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, David. Bye-bye. We're back in our studio and David Bryan brought up the BCRF Hot Pink Party in New York this spring, which is an event I was fortunate to attend. I'll also note it's on BizBash's list of the top 100 events in New York. It's really interesting to me that he brought up the screen uh, as part of the staging. It really was striking and unusual to go into the dining space in the armory and see this massive curved screen it was used to striking effect. You know, you think of Upper East Side galas and you think they, they have to be pretty. And this was, uh, but it can also be functional. And as event designers, you have to be thinking with all parts of your brain. Yeah, no, he really does bring the whole, all, bringing all the senses to everything. And, uh, he, 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 he brings um, uh, this whole idea of delight into a whole new level. Right. He also said something that gets to the motivation that I think a lot of successful event planners um, have. And it's that people said we couldn't do it. You know, that sort of idea. And it's so motivating for so many creative people. It's you dream something outrageous and then you pull it off. Well, that's what that's what he's been able to do over and over again in all these different functions. And he's taking big risks, but they're, cal they're calculated risks. Right. He knows that the chances are that they're going to work out and they've done them so many times that when they they know when they're when they're really sweating. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed hearing about his brainstorming process with his creative team too, and how he pushes them. You know, it sounded like a reality show challenge. Okay, team, everybody go to Dwayne Reed and design an event using what you can find there. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. I mean, it's the, he's the kind of leaders in our industry that are pushing us to uh, new places, I think. Yeah. And then finally, something we all can relate to. He said he lives on Instagram. And I remember seeing one time when he liked one of Bizbash's posts. And, you know, I'll note it also, it wasn't one of his own events. He was just liking something. And it's funny because I got that dopamine rush that, that, you know, we got the Brian Raffinelli seal of approval. And we were excited that we had Brian here uh, doing this special photo shoot on first impressions with leaders in our industry. It's an art project that we're doing with Zipster. And it's kind of a whole new way of looking at the world. And we appreciate Brian participating. So Beth, what's new at BizBash? I wanted to give a shout out to our Toronto listeners. We just published our list of Toronto's top 100 events. We have some new number ones in categories as well as some new additions to this list. And our Toronto-based contributing editor, Nancy Carr, did a great job compiling it. Uh, and for those of you not in Toronto, I would also recommend checking it out because it can be a source of inspiration in terms of event type, concept, design, or other factors. It's a really great thing about these lists. So you can see that at bizbash.com or for those of you who want really specific instructions, it's bizbash.com slash top hyphen 100. And the idea of Toronto, we are so excited to be involved with the city of Toronto because the creativity there is really quite different than other places in a sense because it has a, a, a flair that, that is not what we find in many of our U.S. Um, markets. Uh, and I find that it's uh, refreshing. 
David, I know you wanted to thank some people before we signed off. Yes. So we want to thank our producer, Dave Nelson, for creating our podcast and Claire Hoffman for putting the content together and Rebecca Pappas for getting it distributed and doing all the things involved in the technical side of our podcast. So until we meet again. Gather on. Gather on. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a rating and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you'll join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on. A leader in event education, the Event Leadership Institute offers on-demand video classes, interviews with industry mavericks, and online instructor-led professional development courses taught by industry experts. Visit eventleadershipinstitute.com for more information and to see a schedule of upcoming classes.